Israel launches ground raids against Hezbollah in Lebanon. We have seen troops moving to the north. We see large number of tanks and ground troops. The death toll in the latest U.S. hurricane passes 100 and could climb as high as 600. The destruction we have seen in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia is heartbreaking. And Jimmy Carter becomes the first former U.S. president to reach his 100th birthday. On October 1st, 1924, Lillian Carter gave birth to the first U.S. president born in a hospital. Today is Tuesday, October 1st, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Scott Walterman. Israeli tanks and troops cross the border into Lebanon as a ground offensive appears to be underway against Hezbollah. The IDF said it had begun limited, localized, and targeted ground raids based on precise intelligence hitting Hezbollah targets and infrastructure in southern Lebanon. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has urged Muslims to stand by Lebanon's Hezbollah militia with their resources and their help. But analysts say it's unlikely that Iran will retaliate directly on Israel for the airstrike that killed its prime regional ally, Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah, and his lieutenants. We get more on this part of the story now from Dale Gavlak. Analysts say that Iran will continue to depend on its regional proxies to fight Israel because it wants to avert a direct Israeli hit on the country. Aaron Bregman, Middle East security professor at King's College London, told VOA that Israel has sent a very clear message to Iran with its Sunday attack on its other proxy, Yemen's Houthi rebels, even as it continued to bombard Lebanon. He said the distance between Israel and Yemen is not dissimilar to that of Iran, giving a strong warning to Tehran. It's a big force because you need airplanes to refuel the attacking airplanes. You have to send aircraft to help rescue. So it's a big operation. The Israelis send a message to Iran, look, we did it yesterday in Yemen. We can do it to you and we could eat your oil refinery, and we can even attack your nuclear facilities. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said the fate of this region will be determined by the forces of resistance, with Hezbollah at the forefront. The statement was taken to mean that Hezbollah is responsible for avenging the death of its leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Sanam Vakil, the director for the Middle East program at London's Chatham House think tank, told the New York Times that Iran is completely checkmated by Israel at this moment. Vakil added, Khamenei's statement is indicative of the gravity of the moment and the caution. He is not publicly committing to anything that he can't deliver. Ali Vez, Iran project director with the International Crisis Group, quoted by Saudi Arabia's Arab News, said, Iran is going to stand behind, not with Hezbollah. Tehran's forward defense strategy has always been based on projecting power beyond its borders and deterring, not inviting strikes against its own territory. Nicholas Harris of the Washington-based New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy told VOA that Khamenei has misjudged Israel's military aims, including the strong weakening, if not destruction, of Hezbollah, the repopulation of northern Israel, and the decoupling of Lebanon from Gaza. The Iranians have underestimated Israel. And in order for Iran's strategy of using proxies to try to create a so-called ring of fire around Israel, it requires the Israelis to be deterred. The Israelis are doing the opposite. And so if Iran can't reestablish deterrence, a major part of its strategic doctrine in the Middle East Disappears. Meanwhile, Hezbollah's deputy and now acting leader, 
Naim Qasim, has vowed to carry on the fight with Israel, despite the killing of the militia's top commanders. He said Hezbollah members are ready to fight and defend Lebanon against a possible ground offensive by Israel. Del Gavlak, VOA News. Washington is trying to keep a Mideast war from snowballing after the dramatic events in Lebanon that we've seen over the last couple of days. But regional powers are expressing concerns as Israel's leadership seems determined to continue. From the White House, U.S. President Joe Biden has called for a ceasefire, but VOA's Anita Powell asks, will anyone listen? Lebanon is on fire after Israel's weekend assassination of Hezbollah's leader, a move that threatens to let loose a wider war in the region. On Monday, President Joe Biden was unequivocal about what needs to happen next. I'm more aware than you might know, and I'm comfortable with them stopping. We should have a ceasefire now. But the question is how? How is Washington, Israel's main weapons supplier, going to pull the plug on this violence? VOA asked the White House. Karine Jean-Pierre is White House Press Secretary. Our policy has not changed. It just hasn't. It, It has not changed. Lebanon's leaders say they have no faith in Israel's intentions. Najib Mikati is Lebanon's caretaker prime minister. The government is doing everything in its power to confront this destructive, hateful war that Israel is waging against us. And we went to the United Nations looking for a solution, and we met with world leaders. But the enemy went with the intention of treachery and planning more massacres. And Israel's leader indicated Monday that he is digging in for a fight. Benjamin Netanyahu is Israel's prime minister. We are at war for our very existence. We will join forces, go hand in hand, and defeat our enemies. Meanwhile, Washington is joined by other powers in begging for this to stop. Jean-Noël Barrault is France's foreign minister. There is still hope, but time is short. I therefore urge Israel to refrain from any ground incursions and to a ceasefire. I call on Hezbollah to do the same and to refrain from any action likely to lead to regional destabilization. Analysts say Biden and allies have given Netanyahu options to stop the violence by pushing for a 21-day ceasefire in Lebanon and a deal to free hostages held by Hamas in Gaza as a step toward ending that conflict. Gerald Feierstein is director of the Arabian Peninsula Program and distinguished senior fellow for diplomacy at the Middle East Institute. Unfortunately, I would say that the um, the the history of of their conversations over the past uh, year uh, has been that uh, regardless of what the president's arguments are, regardless of what he has uh, pushed, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is following his own course and is not responding uh, to U.S. uh, concerns or advice. For the people of southern Lebanon and for the region, these are not abstract discussions. This is a matter of life or death. Anita Powell, VOA News, the White House. In the United States, the latest hurricane to come ashore, Hurricane Helene, the death toll has passed 100 and could go much higher. There could be as many as 600 lost lives. That's U.S. Homeland Security Advisor Liz Sherwood Randall. We have more than 3,500 federal response personnel deployed and supporting response efforts across the region, including more than 1,000 personnel from FEMA. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris visited FEMA headquarters in Washington. The destruction we have seen in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia is heartbreaking. Damage estimates ranged from $15 billion to more than $100 billion. Insurers and forecasters made those estimates over the weekend as water systems, communications, and critical transportation routes were affected. We're following these other stories from around the world. Amazon.com won a partial dismissal of a U.S. Federal Trade Commission lawsuit accusing it of maintaining illegal monopolies, though the details of the ruling by a federal court in Seattle on Monday were not immediately clear. 
the FTC has accused the online retailer of using anti-competitive tactics to maintain dominance among online superstores and marketplaces. Qatar Airways unveiled a bid to take a 25% stake in troubled airline Virgin Australia on Tuesday. That's a deal that could shake up Australia's Qantas-dominated market. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration on Monday said SpaceX has to investigate why the second stage of its workhorse Falcon 9 rocket malfunctioned after a NASA astronaut mission on Saturday. They have grounded the rocket for the third time in three months. In our continuing coverage of the 2024 U.S. presidential election, vice presidential candidates J.D. Vance and Tim Walls are scheduled to meet Tuesday for their first and only debate. VOA correspondent Scott Stearns looks at what to expect when the candidates meet in New York. Tim Walls and J.D. Vance will debate on television for 90 minutes Tuesday with two moderators and no live audience. Vance is a U.S. senator from the Midwest state of Ohio who's running with Donald Trump. He says the debate is a chance to show how Republicans will improve the economy and secure the border. It's an opportunity for me to get to tell the American people how I think we can make their lives better and how Donald Trump's policies can make them more prosperous, can make the world more peaceful, and can secure that southern border. If we do those things, we're going to win. Walls is governor of the Midwest state of Minnesota and is running with Kamala Harris. He says Democrats are looking out for working class Americans, unlike his opponent. Like all regular people I grew up with in the heartland, J.D. studied at Yale, (laughs) had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! That's not what middle America is. And I gotta tell you, I can't wait to debate the guy. Vance is a one-time Trump critic who won the former president's endorsement for his Senate run. Vance has since aligned himself with Trump's America first approach. Now our enemies and a a lot of Democrats call us populists like it's something of an insult. But if being a populist means being on the side of working people rather than the powerful elites who hollowed out our middle class and sent us into stupid foreign wars, then sign me up. Vance recently told European leaders they need to pay more to help Ukraine fight off the Russian invasion. Walls says Vance and Trump mean to relinquish U.S. leadership. When Republicans used to talk about freedom, many of them actually meant it. They weren't, they weren't going to turn their backs on our allies. They weren't going to leave Ukraine to themselves. Vance says Harris is hurting working Americans in favor of illegal immigrants. What Kamala Harris seems to want to do is to give all the benefits of American citizenship to people who shouldn't even be here. And that's going to bankrupt this country and make it impossible for normal people to afford to buy a home, to afford to buy groceries, to benefit from that social safety net. Walls says Trump's career in business and in politics shows he's only looking out for rich people like him. Rig the economy for those at the top and screw the people at the bottom. That's what they do. Your costs go up. They repeal the Affordable Care Act and bring us back to pre-existing conditions. They cut Social Security and Medicare, the very things that keeps my mom out of poverty. Tuesday's matchup is the last scheduled debate before the November 5th election, with early voting already underway in some states. Scott Stearns, VOA News. As Austria's far-right Freedom Party struggled on Monday to find allies for a ruling coalition after its historic election victory, its supporters warned that other parties need to respect the voters or will risk pushing everyday Austrians further away from the established political parties. Here's Reuters correspondent Diane Toe with more on that. Joseph Binder felt happy on Monday. The carpenter, who lives in Vienna, was among voters who propelled Austria's far-right Freedom Party to an historic parliamentary win a day before. Binder said his family had long supported the Conservative People's Party, which governs now. But he switched, complaining that its policies are bad for business. There are so many rules and labeling requirements that small businesses can no longer keep up with. And then you feel let down somewhere. You're a compulsory member, but then you no longer feel properly represented. 
And that's also a major reason why more and more people are joining the FPO, expecting and hoping for a better future. Sunday's election saw the FPO draw 29% of votes, still short of a parliamentary majority. To govern, it must now find a coalition partner, but the leaders of rival factions have said they're not interested in a coalition with the FPO's polarizing leader, Herbert Kickel. That refusal has garnered criticism from voters such as Binder, accusing other parties of ignoring the single largest voting bloc. It's undemocratic, and at some point you might even lose touch with the people and then you shouldn't be surprised if they perhaps split off somewhere or make their own plans. The Eurosceptic Russia-friendly FPO has worked to moderate its image. The party wants to stop granting asylum altogether and build a fortress Austria that stops migrants from entering. Some Austrian Turkish citizens are trying to look positively at the prospects of a kickle led government. Kebab seller Berat Öztöprak said there could be worries about people being deported. But, born and raised in Austria and having served in its army, he didn't seem concerned for himself. I pay my taxes. I'm nice to the people here. They're just as nice to me, he said. While Turkish cafe owner Batal Alkan says he's just concerned about crime and believes the Freedom Party could fix the problem. Up until now, I supported the Social Democrats, but they didn't listen to anyone. This street has become such a disaster. I'm an employer and in the last three to four years, people can't even come out on the street anymore because of all the drug dealers and theft. The ruling People's Party, also known as OVP, is the only group that has signaled openness to forming a coalition with the Freedom Party. But its leader, incumbent Chancellor Karl Nehammer, ruled out again on Sunday chances of going into government with Kickel. If Kickel can't bring allies on board, it could mean a comeback from the OVP in coalition with the center-left Social Democrats. Reuters correspondent Diane To reporting. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Day reception to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China now begins. China is marking the 75th year of Communist Party rule. It's a time when economic challenges and security threats linger over the massive state. Please face the national flag and the regional flag on the stage and stand solemnly. There aren't many festivities announced for the occasion Tuesday except for a flag-raising ceremony at Tiananmen Square. Trouble in the skies near Alaska between the U.S. and Russia. The U.S. military has released a video of a close encounter between a U.S. and Russian fighter jets. More now from AP's Lisa Dwyer. The video of the close encounter, September 23rd, shows the Russian plane swooping just feet from the U.S. plane, just weeks after eight Russian military planes and four of its Navy vessels, including two submarines, came close to Alaska as China and Russia conducted joint drills. In July, Russian and Chinese bombers flew together for the first time in international airspace off Alaska in a sign of cooperation that U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said raised concerns. I'm Lisa Dwyer. VOA's International Edition continues. I'm Scott Walterman. A judge in the U.S. state of Georgia struck down the state's abortion law on Monday. We get that story now from Associated Press correspondent 
Ed Donahue. The law took effect two years ago and effectively prohibits abortions beyond six weeks of pregnancy. In his order, Fulton County Superior Court Judge Robert McBurney wrote, Liberty in Georgia includes in its meaning, in its protections, and in its bundle of rights, the power of a woman to control her own body, to decide what happens to it and in it, and to reject state interference with her health care choices. Governor Brian Kemp says once again, the will of Georgians and their representatives have been overruled by the personal beliefs of one judge. He added, Georgia will continue to fight for the lives of the unborn. The ruling, if it stands, means the state returns to the previous law, allowing abortions until roughly 20 weeks into a pregnancy. I'm Ed Donahue. A white South African farmer charged with attempted murder appeared in court on Monday on accusations of running over a six-year-old black boy with a tractor and breaking both his legs. Reuters correspondent Fiona Jones reports on the day in court. Christoffel Stoman is charged with deliberately injuring Kwesi Yankees after accusing the child of stealing an orange from his farm. The case has heightened racial tensions in the Western Cape province. Sarah Bacamela is the cousin of Yankees. I, I, I don't feel like this case must be taken lightly. I feel the state must do and the government must just make an example so that the, even the next person who thinks he went off, he still feels he can do the same thing. He must know that the law will deal with him duly. Family members of both Stoneman and Yankees were present in the courtroom. Reuters correspondent Fiona Jones. And finally, Jimmy Carter turns 100 years old on Tuesday, the first U.S. president in history to mark that milestone birthday. More on the celebration surrounding the event now from VOA's Kane Fairbaugh. America. It was a celebration fit for a centenarian. The Fox Theater in Atlanta hosted dozens of musical acts and thousands of guests for a concert celebrating the 100th birthday love shot, of Georgia's former governor and U.S. President Jimmy Carter. And it's a way to be together, and I think that is who he is fundamentally. Jason Carter believes the concert, featuring some performers who campaigned for his grandfather in the 1970s, is a unifying and bipartisan way to celebrate what one documentary film director calls the rock and roll president. That brings people together across geographies, across culture, across any sort of racial dividing lines. I mean, you'll have Democrats, Republicans in here tonight. One person noticeably absent from the celebration was Jimmy Carter himself. He remains in hospice care at his home, a town 240 kilometers south of Atlanta. It's a 600 person village in the middle of nowhere and all of his other work at the end of the road in Africa has been in those same kinds of 600 person villages and he feels a kinship there, he feels a connection there and I think the, the way that he marks this moment is by being at home. Jimmy Carter celebrates his historic birthday milestone quietly at his home here in Plains, Georgia, where on October 1st, 1924, Lillian Carter gave birth to the first U.S. president born in a hospital. But the only reason he was born in a hospital was because his mother was working that day. Jill Stuckey is a Carter family friend who serves as superintendent of the Jimmy Carter National Historical Park, which includes his preserved Depression era boyhood farm, the Old Plains High School where he studied, and the railroad depot that he converted into his campaign headquarters in his successful 1976 White House bid. Of course, a lot of them head straight to peanut butter ice cream. Stuckey says Plains celebrates their famous neighbor every day, but this historic birthday is marked by serving others. We're um, naturalizing 100 new citizens in his honor. Carter's milestone is a bittersweet occasion in Plains. It's the first spent without his wife, Rosalind, who passed away last November. 77 and a half years of marriage to be without your soulmate. You know, it's very, very tough times. The birthday celebration, which began at the Fox Theater in September and ends in Plains October 1st, brought Carter's large extended family together, including his great grandson, Charlie Carter. You'll probably never be to a bigger birthday party, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe it's 101. <laughs> <laughs> Carter also holds the record for the longest post-presidential career. Since departing the White House in 1981, he and his wife founded the Atlanta-based global nonprofit Carter Center, 
which fights neglected tropical diseases, promotes peaceful conflict resolution, and monitors elections around the world. Causes which led him to be awarded the 2002 Nobel Peace Prize. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Plains, Georgia. This has been International Edition on the Voice of America. On behalf of everyone here at VOA, thank you so much for turning to us and spending this time with us. For pictures, stories, videos, and more, follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform and online at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Scott Walterman.